Steve Berkowitz does an incredible job covering college athletics. It's a great follow on Twitter, USA Today. If a coach gets a team into a tournament, wins a championship, a conference, whatever, Steve knows exactly what the bonus structure might be. He joins us on 365 Sports, but also on the Dartmouth story. Steve, thank you for your time on 365 Sports. So what's happening? What's the latest with Dartmouth? And did they miss some sort of a di- a deadline of filing what they needed? Uh, yeah, what, ha- well, what happened here is that uh, I mean, first of all, I don't know if you need me to back up and explain how this whole this, this whole story got started, or yeah, if go you ahead. need me to talk about this. this so what what has, what has happened here is that uh, athletes on the Dartmouth men's basketball team uh, filed a uh, a complaint with the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, they are seeking to have the opportunity to have an election about whether or not to form a union among the players. Um, so they went through the case and they had an evidentiary process that went before a regional director of the National Labor Relations Board. The regional director uh, found that the athletes were employees of the university and that the athletes should be able to have an election as to whether or not they want to form a union. Um, Dartmouth, more rec- most recently, had asked for the regional director to reopen uh, evidence in the case, to reopen the record, uh, essentially trying to you know, ask the regional director to reconsider her decision. And she declined to do that uh, on a number of bases, one of which was that the school had missed this filing deadline to make that request. I mean, I think even if they had met that deadline, that the regional director was not going to accept that request. So, Steve, uh, for those people wondering that if Dartmouth does achieve this eventually, you know, whenever that is, if this is going to spread like wildfire – would you caution that it's not going to be wildfire and be maybe more of a, a trickle? Because ask anyone who works for Amazon how quickly they've they've been able to form unions in 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 that regard. Well, I mean, first of all, with with Dartmouth, the school has made clear that they are going to seek a review of the regional director's decision by the full National Labor Relations Board. So um, that's going to take time. It may take up at least a year. That could take as long as a year, if not longer. Uh, I believe in the case of the Northwestern football team, when they did the same kind of thing about 10 years ago, I believe that process ran about 14 months. Um, And if Dartmouth doesn't like the outcome that they get from the National Labor Relations Board, they have the ability to appeal this into the federal, uh, to a federal appeals court. So they can string this out for several more years. Um, Having said that, um, you know, if you have a group of athletes at Dartmouth on the basketball team who choose to unionize, yes, that may embolden athletes at other private schools to attempt to unionize. Right now, the National Labor Relations Act uh, only covers people at private employers. So that's, you know, keeps it pretty narrow for the time being. And obviously, presumably, it's a little easier to get 15 guys or 17 guys on a basketball team to agree to unionize than it is to get 85 or 90 guys or 100 guys on a football team to do that. Um, The place where this gets more interesting is the National Labor Relations Board regional director in in Southern California is hearing a case involving uh, football, men's basketball, and women's basketball players at USC. And that case is pursuing a slightly different uh, legal theory. And that theory uh, involves holding that the NCAA and the Pac-12 are joint employers with USC. And that would create a circumstance that under labor law gets around the National Labor Relations Act uh, uh, being applicable only to a private employer because they're suing multiple employers. And if they're joint employers, then it can be applicable to everybody. And so that's a much bigger potential problem. Now you have rules against the unionization of public employees in a lot of states, but that would be a much bigger deal than what's going on at Dartmouth. And the thing at Dartmouth could be a very big deal, but the one at USC could be an even bigger deal. Steve. So yeah, if that's, I mean, that's again, a much bigger thing. And you're talking about three different schools. Where do you see this working as it goes state by state? Because there are, you know, like States like here in Texas, where we don't have unions, we're right to work state. So uh, that makes it more difficult. Does this going to have to be federally decided? How does it work? 
Well, I mean, again, it depends on how it all on how it all plays out. I mean, and in the meantime, while this, you know, while presumably Dartmouth continues to appeal this, so even if the vote is is held tomorrow and the votes are counted tomorrow, and the athletes, you know, vote to unionize, which seems like is what's going to happen, nothing's going to happen, you know, in the meantime with the with the athletes at Dartmouth until you know, until it plays out through the courts. Now, again, you, will you consider, will you continue to see more and more of these kinds of unionization efforts at other schools? You might. And that will, again, continue to ratchet up the pressure on uh, colleges to, you know, change how they're working with their athletes, either through collective bargaining, some type of revenue sharing, or some other type of arrangement that would uh, create additional rights uh, and compensation for the athletes. What could go wrong if, in fact, this gets to that point where a lot of people start to unionize as far as student athletes, college athletes? Well, I mean, it sort of depends on who you talk to. I mean, the schools will tell you that all kinds of horrible things will ensue uh, if you have a union and employment and collective bargaining. Um, and, you know, it just sort of depends on your point of view about those kinds of things. Uh, you know, I mean, the colleges talk about how well the athletes will be in a position where they could be fired. Well, there are people who follow the Colorado football team who would argue that Deion Sanders fired football players last year. Now, Sanders would say to you, well, I didn't tell anybody, you know, I didn't say to anybody they had, they had, they had to leave. Uh, you know, they chose to leave. I was honest with them about how much playing time they would get, and then they chose to go. So, I mean, there are a lot of different ways that you can look at this. I mean, there are a variety of other implications for schools in terms of having to pay employment taxes and in ways that potentially increase the cost. Um, but, you know, how all of that plays out in the long run, it's really difficult to tell. I mean, obviously, it would change a lot of things in how college sports works, uh, whether or not colleges or universities would want to continue to participate in big time college sports with that kind of a circumstance, whether or not it would have financial implications for the schools. I mean, and there's a school of thought that if this happens, you know, nothing will change. The athletes will simply collectively bargain. And, you know, the, the, the nature of the arrangements between the schools and the athletes will change in that regard. But everything else will go along. And it may only involve athletes in certain sports. And the schools will continue to fundraise and find ways to finance it and make it all work. Here's a question from Conundrum in our chat room. Will the unionization have any impact on nonprofit status of college IRS implications? That's really hard to say. I mean, you have you have employee unions that deal with schools already for certain for certain employment. So I'm not certain that this would have any impact on the school's 501c3 status. Steve, uh, is it as complicated as you've ever seen? Do we does this last for like never ending, or do you feel like we're going to have some sort of, I don't want to use those word guard, that word guardrails, but do you see some of this tidying up in any way? I think in, I mean, you can foresee a outcome where you sort of settle all of this within a certain period of time, whether or not these cases play out in court, whether or not there are settlements reached in various of the legal cases, because don't forget, I mean, there are a whole series of other antitrust related lawsuits that range from what's been going on recently with uh, Tennessee and Virginia taking on the NCAA uh, as it pertains to the mm -hmm. so-called NIL recruitment of athletes out of high school or through the transfer portal. Uh, and, and you have sort of similar but slightly different uh, antitrust challenges going on in three different lawsuits either in California or in Colorado. So, you know, if you can figure out a way to sort of globally settle all of this, that would bring some certainty to it. Uh, certainly, if Congress were to take action uh, and the president were to sign a law to that effect, that could also bring some clarity to all of this. Um, but it doesn't appear like that's uh, happening anytime soon. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to see uh, anything but sort of continued churn on this unless you find a way to sort of craft out a sort of a global settlement to keep, you know, to, to make this uh, work out for the athletes in a, in a different, in a different way than what you have right now. 
You have, uh, and Steve Berkowitz, again, USA Today with us by Berkowitz on Twitter. You have an enormous um, number of coaching-type bonus structures or whatever. How thick a book is that or in your computer of how much you have for each coach based on public schools, private schools, whatever, when somebody wins something? It depends on the sport. Um, certainly in football, the bonuses are larger than they are in men's basketball or in women's basketball. Uh, but pretty much any contract with a co with a head coach, and really for, for most of the assistant coaches, there is a bonus attached. There are bonuses attached to team achievement of some type, whether it's athletic on the field achievement, whether it's academic achievement. Some coaches have bonuses that are connected to the citizenship and social responsibility and community service of their athletes. And it's not just the coaches. I mean, athletics directors uh, have bonuses as well that are tied in mm -hmm. their contracts that in some cases have to do with the specific performance of specific teams. I mean, athletic director bonuses also have to do with sort of broader departmental wide goals, for example, like budgeting and things like that. But, you know, basically employment contracts across the board for uh, coaches and administrators in positions of, of you know, that are at the higher end of positions of authority have bonuses attached to them that are based on achievement, you know, by the athletes or by the department. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate your time. Good stuff. Steve Berkowitz, USA Today with us, Dartmouth, and that unionization and uh, what was going on today in the courts or uh, what is next.